Okay, good evening and thank you everyone for joining the first program of our webinar series, Transitioning to DMEC with the Dork Tube. We are so excited to have you all with us. Just a few quick housekeeping notes I'd like to cover before we begin. In an effort to eliminate all background noise, all participants will be muted throughout the duration of the webinar. If you would like to ask a question, you may do so by typing your question into the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen. We will address all questions at the end of the webinar. At this time, I would like to introduce our speaker for this evening, Dr. Parag Majmadar. Dr. Majmadar is a fellowship trained corneal and refractive surgery specialist and a practicing physician at Chicago Cornea Consultants. Dr. Majmadar is an active participant in clinical research activities and is a highly regarded lecturer and instructor on the subjects of corneal and refractive surgery. He serves as an associate professor of ophthalmology and formerly co-directed the Cornea Fellowship at Rush University in Chicago. Dr. Majmandar, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Michelle, thank you to Eversight uh, for putting on this uh, event, which I think is gonna be very well received over the next few weeks. We have some really fantastic people who are presenting on topics uh, very near and dear to all of us corneal specialists. Thank you to all for uh, joining us uh, this evening. Today we're going to be talking about DMEC and specifically how to transition to DMEC if you're just kind of getting started in it. And also if you're a little bit more advanced uh, DMEC user, there's some new advances from Eversight who um, has really been at the forefront of this from day one since I started uh, working with them to bring DMEC here to the United States in 2013. Um, they've been very progressive about uh, listening to us and, and wanting to help us improve our ability to provide this amazing procedure. So we're going to talk a little bit about that a little bit and then save some time at the end for questions. Um, I do have a lot of material, a lot of videos, and I'm going to try to speed through some of the things. But if you have questions, please, you know, type them into the uh, chat, chat box. Uh, we'll try to address some of them as they come up. And, and if not, then we'll try to answer them uh, live as well. So um, over the past 15 years, I'm sure that you've all seen that there has been a, a tremendous shift away from penetrating keratoplasty towards uh, lamellar techniques. And while we can talk about anterior lamellar techniques in a different uh, webinar, today we're going to specifically focus on the posterior lamellar techniques, which I think have really gained a lot of popularity among corneal surgeons for the fact that the visual rehabilitation is much, much, much faster than we've ever seen uh, in the past with penetrating keratoplasty. To kind of give you a little bit of a, a graphic representation, uh, we started doing uh, DSEC surgery, uh, which you can see here. I don't know if you can see my cursor on the screen here or not, probably not because I can't see it. But if you look at the, um, um, uh, the, the little schematic here, you can see that in the, the, the final situation, what we're doing to the host cornea is putting in a little patch that's represented by the yellow and the red, which represents a little bit of donor stroma as well as the donor endothelium, and that was called DSEC. And many of you are probably doing DSEC very, very successfully. Um, and then we transitioned, as I said, about 2013 is when I started getting involved with DMEC, and that involves just taking the endothelium. And you can see that it's almost an exact anatomical replacement for the situation that we found the patient in to begin with. So if you look all the way to the left, um, that image looks very similar to the image all the way on the right. And unlike DSEC, which increases the corneal thickness and provides an optical layer uh, in between the, the stroma of the patient and the stroma of the donor, uh, we don't get that with DMEC. And that really kind of points to why DMEC is such a, a better procedure in terms of uh, visual rehabilitation and, and visual quality. Something new that we, you may be hearing about and you may be doing it as well is something called decimase stripping. And this is a procedure that's been kind of popularized uh, in, in Europe and Asia and here uh, in the United States. A lot of surgeons are starting to do this. I know there are a few clinical trials that are underway to find out whether or not we actually need to replace the endothelium. So still a lot of, lot of work to be done in this area, but you may be hearing about it. And so that's why I'm kind of just introducing the concept to you. But um, we have, as I said, we have seen this tremendous shift over the last decade in terms of the numbers of cases that are being done. Uh, it's kind of a busy slide, but if you focus on the first two rows, uh, if you look in 2010, there were 19,000 endothelial keratoplasties done, and that was, I would, my, my majority of them were DSEC. And look at 2018, 
uh, and 2019, you can see that there is now more than 30,000 procedures that are being done. Um, and these are a com combination of DMEC and DSEC. All the while, you can look at that first, first row where penetrating keratoplasty numbers are decreasing steadily as well as we're shifting some of these endothelial dystrophy patients from penetrating keratoplasty to lamellar uh, techniques. And I am kind of stuck here. Hold on a second. My slides are not advancing for some reason. There we go. Um, the, um, this, this slide looks at specifically endothelial keratoplasty procedures. So you can really see, look at the third row, um, the, the DMEC procedures in 2013 in the United States, this is from all IBANCs as part of the EVAA results, 1,500 cases. And in 2019, there were 13,000 cases. So we're really seeing a tremendous increase in the number of DMEC cases specifically. And there's a lot of reasons for that, and we'll go into that in a few seconds. Again, just a graphic ex, uh, representation of, of the number of, of DSEC cases, DMEC cases, as well as uh, penetrating keratoplasty cases. And you can see the green line on the bottom represents a steady improvement or increase in the utilization uh, of DMEC. And so why is this revolution happening? Why are we doing selective endothelial replacement? Well, it went from something called DLEC, which was uh, initiated or developed by uh, Harriet Mellis uh, in Rotterdam, to DSEC, to DMEC. And we're really seeing that there's a real a strong reason for this, and that is that the visual results are outstanding. Now, you know, a lot of people say that, well, my results with DSEC are great too, but, and they are but I think that DMEC is just slightly better in, in a lot of different ways. Why are people hesitant to learn DMEC? And this is from Mark Terry, who did some work on this uh, a few years ago. And, and some, of the, some of the feedback or con the con criticisms of DMEC were that it was too hard, it would take too long. We didn't want to be stuck stripping the donor and messing it up, which is, is, is difficult, by the way. Uh, have, as having had done that, I can tell you. Uh, and they found that the rebubble rate was really high. And again, patients were very happy with DSEC. So why change? Well, again, it's a more exact anatomic re replacement. You get better visual results, faster visual results, and a lower rejection rate. And so, you know, even now I see people all the time, you know, I really haven't done a lot of DMEX. I'm not quite sure. But I'm here to tell you that if you can do DSEC, you can do DMEX. There's absolutely nothing different about it except for a few little things, a few little tips and tricks, which I can show you. Um, as we go forward. But I think the number one reason that I got into DMEC is because Eversight supported me in 2013 in getting this procedure here to, to locally uh, where I am in Chicago and, and all over uh, their, their, um, their broad reach uh, where, where they uh, provide services. And, and they've continued to remove barriers. And a lot of these barriers are in terms of the learning curve. I don't have to harvest my own graft. Um, you know, in the beginning, what we had to do is we had to take a, um, a, a graph like this, which was prepared, uh, and I had to just kind of stain it and then peel it off and then put it into a tube uh, and then implant it. I don't even have to do that anymore. And there's so many more advances that have been, that have been developed. Uh, the way that the graft is introduced into the eye is using some type of a glass tube. And the glass tube is because that there's they found that there's very little endothelial damage when using a glass tube as opposed to plastic. I know some people are representing or, 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 uh, or recommending using um, an IOL cartridge and, and some people are result, and the results are very good, but the glass tube in my opinion has been very, very helpful. And initially a lot of surgeons and most of the eye banks that I had, had heard of were using a Jones tube or modified Jones tube. And that was a problem for a lot of reasons. The number one thing was that you had to find IV tubing to connect the tube. And it was very time consuming to get that little IV tubing on, cut it, put it on there, attach it to a syringe. The problem with the Jones tube itself was that it had a very short and fat configuration, very wide diameter, relatively speaking, and a very short length. So it required a larger incision, uh, 3.2 or above. But even then I would find that sometimes you stuck the tube in and then the ch chamber was shallow and there would be a significant risk of graft extrusion as you're implanting the lens or the graft, which we really don't want to deal with. And so when I uh, did my training, I went to Rotterdam in 2013 uh, to, to train under Herat Mellis, and, and they had been using a, a tube man manufactured by a Dutch company called DORC, D-O-R-C, Dutch Ophthalmic Research Company. And that tube was fantastic. And, and I made it my mission, and thank, thanks to Eversight for listening to my insanity, and they, uh, 
worked with me every step of the way to get this tube available to us. Now, Eversight not only offers preloaded, pre-stained, pre-stamped tissue, which is making the procedure extremely, it's almost like a preloaded ILL, um, and so no one has to deal with, with the hassle of loading it. Now, the dork tube is offered. And this dork tube allows me to insert this into a 2.4 millimeter incision. It has a very long neck so that you don't have any chamber uh, instability. It already comes ready to attach to any syringe within seconds. You don't have to go hunt for IV tubing. You don't have to cut it. You don't have to stick it on. You just, any syringe, you put a little BSS in it, attach it, and go. And it has reduced my surgical time in half. This is a little video I made for uh, then, and hopefully the audio will come through. By adopting the Dork injection system for its pre-stripped, pre-stained, pre-stamped, and pre-loaded DMEC tissue, Eversight has streamlined the DMEC procedure for surgeons of all levels. The tissue can be inserted through a 2.4 millimeter incision, thereby eliminating the need to enlarge the incision. The unique architecture of the Dork tube with its small diameter and long neck allows for complete control of the anterior chamber during insertion. I've been using the Dork system and Eversight DMEC tissue both since 2013, and I couldn't be happier that the two are now available together. So this is another um, video just showing exactly the same thing that we saw earlier, where we're in, inserting the, the, uh, the, the graft in from a 2.4 millimeter um, incision and then placing a suture before we start to do our DMEC dance, as it's called. Um, this is another uh, video that shows uh, the same thing. And again, you can see how using that very long, narrow, thin Dork tube allows me to get into the anterior chamber without chamber uh, flattening. There's very little risk of extrusion of the graft outside the eye. Um, and it's really made it very, very ergonomic in terms of the procedure and not only that, again, the, you can't put, a, put a, you know, value on the fact that you don't have to find the tubing to cut it and you know, attach it and, and everything else. So uh, at this point, now we have a preloaded, pre-stained, pre-stamped, you know, uh, uh, pre-tubed uh, graft that all we have to really do is just implant it. So it's made this procedure immensely easier. And I know what you're gonna say, you're gonna say, okay, well, you know, I still have to get the darn thing to unfold. And, and there are some challenges with that, but, but I think that with enough commitment and practice, you can master this DMEC dance. Um, there are just some simple guidelines and some simple pearls that I'm just gonna share with you. This is from the, um, uh, an article or a presentation that Peter Veldman from the University of Chicago did. And he kind of really made this very graphically easy to understand that there are just a very few ways that a DMEC graft can show up inside or present itself inside the eye. You can have a scroll as, it, as it's shown here. You can have a double scroll where the edges are kind of a little bit more tightly scrolled together. You can have a simple fold where it's almost like a partial taco. Um, you can have it flipped over sometime, we'll talk about that. Or you can have it where it's kind of tacoed where there's not much separation between the two leaflets. Uh, or a little edge fold, a bouquet where it's a little wider at the top than on the bottom. And then also my favorite, which is origami, which is basically looks like a little paper, um, little uh, bird or whatever you want to call it here. And that sometimes will happen with graphs. And the key is to realize is that any of these configurations are very, very easy to get back to a normal situation. If you had to pick one configuration that you'd want to be in predominantly, it is this bouquet or a um, simple fold or a double scroll or double or a regular scroll, because then you have a situation where the graph, based on the aqueous uh, fluid dynamics, will flatten itself almost by itself, almost. And so that's where I think when I train uh, fellows to do this procedure is to get them to get that graph into that particular position. So the number one, two, and three rules for DMEC are the same. 
you know, a deep chamber is your enemy. You do not want a very deep chamber. Now, this is in contrast to DSEC, where we want a very deep chamber so that the graft can unfold. Now, in, in DMEC, we want a very, very, very shallow chamber. And the other rule is that air bubbles are your enemy, um, even tiny ones. And so if you are seeing any kind of air bubble in the eye, in the anterior chamber with the graft, you need to get it out. And it's very simple to put a syringe in and just pull it out because any kind of air bubble, any kind of material like vitreous will impede your ability to unfold that graft. So if you're getting a situation where no matter what you're doing, you just can't get the graft to unfold, think, is there a bubble there? Is there vitreous there? I just had a case before all this COVID madness started where uh, I did a deep, routine DMAC. I mean, it should take me about 10 or 15 minutes. And I got in there, got the graft in there, and it just would not open. And this is a patient who had had a IOL put in probably 25 years ago. And due to whatever forces that were going on, there was vitreous, you know, in that, in that chamber. Uh, and I had to end, had to remove the graft, do a vitrectomy, and then graft, you know, attached very well after, unfold and attached very well. So pay attention to that. There are reasons why the graft is not unfolding. So there are times when you want to deepen uh, the anterior chamber, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But the um, uh, way to flatten the chamber, some people put their finger, you know, on the eye. Uh, I just like to release aqueous from the main incision periodically, uh, or the paracentesis periodically using my cannula. I think that's the most elegant way to do it. So the um, techniques that we use, there's only a few of them. I'm going to kind of show you a couple of videos in the last few minutes that we have here. Uh, the tap technique is your go-to move. And most of the time, this is the only thing you need, and it gets the ball rolling. And this is a, a, a slide or a video from Mike, Mike Straco. Um, basically, he's kind of using his finger to push on the globe, and then he's just going to tap. He's just going to tap the surface. And all that does is redistribute some of the aqueous forces and force the leaflets of the graft open. So little tap, little tap, little tap, and that is probably 90% of your battle right there. If the graft unfolds here, you know you're in great shape. The next sort of technique that I like to use and I use a lot is the Derisommer technique from Martin Derisommer, and this, or it's called also the two cannula technique, and this is probably the second most common technique that I use, and I'll show you a little video of this. So you can see I've got my nice little scroll here, um, and I'm going to use two cannulas to just put gentle pressure. And one cannula has a little bit more pressure than the other because it almost kind of pins down the graft against the iris. And no, that doesn't damage the endothelium at all. Uh, just kind of gentle pressure will, will keep that graft from moving. And you can see here that I'm going to deflate the chamber a little bit. I'm going to release a little bit of aqueous. And just look at that. Look how much the graft unfolded just by deepening the chamber. Now I'm grabbing the leaflet with the yellow one that's open. That side is open, and I'm tapping on the other side to open it up. Now you can see it's shifted a little bit, so I'm kind of just pushing it back, pushing it back to the. Did did, you, did we lose something here? Anybody, everybody, everybody still there? Yes, we're still here. My my screen just sort of went away. I don't know what happened here. It did. Uh, there we go. Let me try to get back. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. Um, this is the two cannula technique that I was showing you here where it had kind of shifted off to the side. And now I'm just using little gentle strokes to kind of recenter the graph. But you can see how shallowing the chamber first opened up the majority of it. And then my two cannula technique held down one side and allowed the other cannula to open it up. This is a technique from Isabel de Pena, which is called a bubble rolling technique. And as I said, the bubbles will prevent the graft from unfolding because it's a solid barrier. But what this technique relies on is using a small bubble to push open those leaflets of the graft so that it can't scroll back on itself. This is not something that I have to use very often, but look how the one side of this graft is wide open. The other side is a very tight scroll. The younger the, the, the donor, um, the more likely this is to happen. So we like to ask for um, donors that are over 40, 50 is even better. And most of them, frankly, you know, fortunately are, are that age, but sometimes we get younger patients and we want younger donors, but sometimes you have to deal with tight scrolls like this. And you can see here that my two cannula technique just isn't working. I mean, I'm just not getting anywhere. 
there is that little air bubble in there, but that's not impeding it. If the air bubble were on the opposite side of that roll, that scroll, then it would impede the progress. But I'm, I'm here now going to use a little bit of an air bubble. And I think this is one where I kind of put too much air in right away here. But if I put a tiny, tiny little air bubble in, that's not too bad, maybe a little too big. But now look how, look how that graph wants to just be pushed right away. Look how, look how that bubble is just pushing that graph open. And you keep maneuvering, you keep doing this, um, get the graph centered a little bit more. I'm just gonna fast forward a little bit in the interest of time. I know this must be enthralling for all of you, but I'm gonna fast forward it. So you can see here that I'm using that bubble to prevent the scroll from rolling back on itself. And so by doing this over and over again, you're gonna get that pressure from the bubble and the bubble almost acts like a, a third hand or a second hand in there, just holds that graft open. And by the time you finally teased it out, this is, takes a little bit longer in this type of a case. Now I'm leaving that air bubble in there to, if, as soon as that air bubble is pulled out, what's gonna happen? It's gonna scroll up again like a, like a, like a blind. Um, it's gonna scroll, or a window shade, it's gonna scroll right back up. So now the key would be to get another air bubble underneath it if you're using air or SF6 or something, and then if slowly you evacuate that bubble from the top. But this is used for those kinds of cases where you have significant difficulty in unscrolling um, the cannula. This one is, um, I'm going to fast forward here. I don't believe there's anything new here. This one is, is probably one of my, to date, probably one of my toughest cases. And I'm not going to show you that. I'm not going to show you the whole thing. I had a problem with this. Didn't play the other day. Didn't, didn't play again today. I'll, I'll walk you through it just verbally. This was, you can see how tight that scroll is. And every time I would get it open, even with an air bubble technique, even with anything, it would just scroll right back up. And, and this one is almost like going out, you know, deep sea fishing and kind of catching that big one. And, and it takes some time, but you can tame this and, and it can work. And we can kind of go over some of these other things offline or, or in, you know, individually, if anybody has any questions about managing these tight scrolls. But again, if you ask, your, your Eversight to give you um, a little bit older donor tissue, this is very, very unlikely to create a problem for you. But there are techniques to get through this, and I would certainly um, be happy to talk about any of those things in the future uh, individually. So one of the issues that we've had in the past is making sure, and the onus was on us, to make sure that the graft was not upside down. And why don't we want it to be upside down? Obviously, we don't want the endothelium to be in contact with the stroma because it will be non-functional. In the past, Mellis's group recommended using a technique called the Mutsuris sign. And while the graft is scrolled inside the eye, you can insert a little cannula into the scroll. And when you do that, you can see that if you look at the image at the lower right, the cannula as it is entering into the eye has a silver color, but as soon as it gets underneath, it is blue because it's being um, uh, transmitted through the, the, the tripan blue stain. And so what you can do is, the graft orientation has to be that those scrolls have to be facing upwards. If those scrolls are underneath, uh, almost like a upside down U, we want it to be in a U shape. If it's un up underneath it, then you know that it's upside down. Sometimes the graphs folded funny and sometimes I could have sworn that it's in the right configuration, but we had a primary graft failure. And it might've been because the graft was not oriented properly, even though we thought that the Mutsura sign was followed exactly. However, a few years ago, most uh, eye banks and Eversight was, was one of the first to do this as well, is they can ink a dry ink stamp in the shape of the letter S, as in Sam, because it will help you identify whether it's upside down. And so now we've eliminated that also from our list of things to worry about. This is what it looks like. As before they um, trefine it, before they, you know, pre, they pre-strip it, and they will mark the stromal surface of your DMEC graph with a little s. And this has, trim, this has made a huge difference. If you look here, and I can't point to it, but if you look on the picture at about nine o'clock, you can see a backwards s there. And this is a graph that is upside down. It's very easy to, I, I highlighted it for you here. It's very easy to see that when you have a letter s there. Again, letter s, perfect configuration. Again, higher magnification, perfect configuration. There's also a possibility of using an F stamp. I'm not sure if anybody does that, but some people thought that it might result in less ink being used and potentially less endothelial damage. Although we haven't really seen um, you know, much endothelial toxicity from this. Um, and as I said, in the past, I feel like I'm an experienced DMEC surgeon, but I would have sworn that the graft was correct. Uh, and 
only when I put an air bubble underneath and I see, oh, you know what, this is upside down. And so sometimes you can get fooled and having that S stamp is, has been absolutely a lifesaver. Um, if the graph is upside down, what do you do? Nothing, don't panic. A um, few short bursts of saline will flip the graph within seconds. So here's an, a little video of me doing this. So here I am, uh, let me try to fast forward a little bit here. I think everything looks great. I'm unfolding it. I'm flattening the chamber. I'm doing a two cannula technique. Here we go. Looks like that letter S to me looks like it's fine right there, but you're actually seeing the reflection underneath it. So watch this now as I'm doing this, I'm going forward. Oops, sorry. I'm opening it up here. And as I open my two cannula technique, look at that letter S. You can see it there, right there. Oh boy, that's the wrong orientation. So now what do you do? It's no big deal. You put a few little bursts of fluid and watch how quickly the thing flips over. It's just gonna flip right over just like that. And then you go back to your normal technique. And once you are done, you can see the letter S clearly in the right configuration and that's it. So upside down graphs do happen. The S stamp has been absolutely invaluable um, and don't panic if that does happen. Okay. so. Here is um, uh, tips on rebubbling, because you will rebubble. And don't be afraid of rebubbling. I rebubble all these at the slint lamp. And I'm, I'm a little probably quick to rebubble than most. Mellis says that if it's less than 30% of graph separation, you don't need to. A lot of times it will come back by itself, and he's right. But I kind of like to see if it's centrally. I like to bubble sooner than later, because now I've gotten to a situation where I don't have to take him back to the operating room. I can do it right at my slit lamp. I will put a speculum in right at the slit lamp and I have a little cannula that I'll use, uh, and I can put SF6 or air right at the slit lamp. And it's very, very easy. Patients are not in any discomfort, right? significant discomfort, I would say. Um, and you can, you can do this very, very uh, simply and easily at the slit lamp. You can also do this in a supine position. I do have a minor procedure room where um, if you have to, you can put them um, uh, supine and evacuate the aqueous, inject a full air bubble. I don't need to do that. I've done 99% of these when I do them, I do them in the clinic, in my slit lamp, no other use of uh, resources. You don't have to take them back to the operating room or anything else. You can't bill for the rebubbling in the clinic, but that's fine. Most of these patients, I rebubble often just to keep them in their course, not, not have such a prolonged course. So I don't want them to take three, two, three weeks to kind of attach. I want them to attach, hopefully if I can, within a week to 10 days would be my goal. And, and if nothing else convinces you, um, you know, as far as doing DMEC versus DSEC, this is my first few patients that I had DSEC on one eye. And then I said, hey, let me try something new on you. And they were all very receptive, thankfully. This is a patient here on the left had DSEC. You can see on Sutland picture that thickened stroma. His acuity at three weeks was still 2200. In the other eye, three weeks, he was already 2040. And this is the OCT. You can see how thick the cornea is, 734 with a DSEC graft on the top. The DMEC graft in three weeks was already 600. And obviously we know that the thickness is gonna be higher with DSEC and I don't think it's a problem. Just, just saying that this really is a more exact anatomic replication. There's a second patient I did, the DSEC at four months, he was seeing 2040 uncorrected. At four days, the DMEC, you can see the bubble is about eh, 30, 40%. On, on the right side of your screen. And once that air bubble clears, because you can't see through the air, but at, at, at four days, this patient was seeing 2040. Same slit lamp picture here, you can see how much nicer and thinner the cornea looks. And this is that patient at four days. You can see the air bubble about 40, 50%, not, not 50, but 30, 40%. And his vision, as soon as that uh, air bubble cleared the pupil, his vision was 2040. So in summary, you can do DMEC. I want you all to start doing DMEC. Eversight, partnering, partnering with them has been the best decision that I've made. It's it, because they have made a commitment to staying abreast of these innovations. I can't tell you how many discussions I've had with them trying to try different things. The latest thing is this dork tube, which I, I, I find has been absolutely fantastic. And anyone who's used it has said that this has made the procedure shorter by 30 to 40%. And it's much, much more user-friendly. Um, and I am so thankful that Eversight listened to my continuous harping over the last five years um, and got this product out to all of our all of their surgeons. Um, I've done lots of other things with Eversight. You know, we did a study on PDEC 
versus DMEC. PDEC is another form of endothelial transplantation, which I won't get into, but, but we did a study and they've been very, very, very um, forthcoming and, and, and such a great partner to work with. And I can't speak enough uh, good things about them. And so I'm, I'm glad you all have um, partnered with them as well. I think they will make your life easy as you transition to DMEC. If you haven't already, they will provide you with additional DSEC tissue as an emergency in case it doesn't work out. Um, I am always able to answer any questions offline, by email, in person. I've had people come and watch me in, in the operating room, and you have an open invitation to do that. Um, and I'm sure any of, the, any of the folks at Eversight can help uh, coordinate that if need be. So I'm going to leave it at that for now. Uh, I would like to take the last couple minutes um, and answer some questions. Um, so if um, Michelle, are we going to, you want to read the questions out? Yes, we, we do have a couple of questions that did come in. So sure. I'll read them off to you and, uh, and then I'll turn it over to you. Uh, first question from Dr. Natalie Chung. For the dork tube, does it matter if the bevel, if, if this is bevel up or bevel down when you insert in the eye? Good question. So the, the dork tube really doesn't have much of a bevel, maybe a slight. I tend to use the bevel, if whatever you want to call that, small little bevel uh, down as I insert it into the eye. But it just makes it easier. But it's not a, it's not like the Jones tube where if you put it, you know, bevel up or down, you're going to see a significant resistance. It's really very easy to get through that small 2.4 millimeter incision. So my DMEC procedure is exactly the same as my cataract. I use 2.4 millimeter incision for my FACOs. And so it's the same equipment, same everything that the scrub nurses are very familiar with it. Uh, I don't have to enlarge it or anything. I do put a suture in just because once I put the graft in, I do suture because I don't want the graft to extrude. But you can do this sutureless if you really wanted to do that. But to answer your bevel question again, it, there's a very slight bevel on this, if any, and it really doesn't matter which way you do it. I just happen to, um, the curve of the, D, the dork tube is sort of one way only. And so I think that's a slight, um, you know, slight uh, bevel down, but it, but to, for the most part, there's only one way to put this thing in, which again makes it very um, easy to easy to to standardize within your own within your own practice. All right. Next question from Dr. Ahmed Omar: Can you see the correct graft orientation in the tip of the dork tube before injection, because it is narrower than the modified Jones tube? Also, do you need to flush the life force C out of the glass tube before injection into the anterior chamber or just let it sit in BSS for a few minutes? So, good question. So, I, do, I, I don't believe I'm, you're not able to see the orientation because the tube is narrow, as you pointed out, and the graft folds on itself. I've never been a big believer that even if you were to take a larger diameter tube and correctly orient the graft, it may not stay in that orientation when you put it into the eye and let the fluidics take over. So I'm not a big believer that it has to be in a certain orientation, but because the Jones tube is narrower, you don't see the correct orientation. The graft is folded up um, or scrolled up into a, a smaller area, so you don't see the orientation at all. And the second question was, do you need to flush out the, the solution? And, and I don't. Um, it comes kind of ready to go, but as you take off the little stopper at the end and you've connected your syringe, as you are uh, injecting, you can release some of the excess fluid out before you, know, you get into the eye. But I haven't found that that has cre created any problems at all in, in, uh, in terms of any endothelial toxicity from having that fluid there. Okay. Next question also from Dr. Ahmed Omar. Can you please give more info on the rebubble cannula? Uh, sure. So I use, and I don't, I, I can find out for you, I don't know the exact model or anything else, but it's basically, if any of you do LASIK, it's what I use for my LASIK um, uh, irrigating under the flap and putting the flap down. So it's a 27 gauge uh, curved cannula. It has a little, it's not a round tip. It's almost got like a little, um, like a little bevel on it. Um, but you can use anything. It doesn't really matter. All you're trying to do is to get a little bit of the SF6 or the air, whatever you're going to use, um, into a, a, through the paracentesis. And the paracentesis will be there um, for you know a while. Obviously, you can reopen it. Sometimes, ergonomically, I found that if I'm rebubbling at the slit lamp, let's say that it's the left eye. Let's say that my paracentesis is about 
uh, two o'clock and let's say four o'clock or five o'clock. Uh, but my graft is now detached temporally. Well, I don't necessarily want to put a cannula in temporally and push fluid because that's going to probably promote more graft detachment. So what I'll do sometimes is I might take a little um, a paracentesis blade and I have these short ones that I can use at the slit lamp and I can just make a paracentesis inferiorly, for example, or even nasally if I have to and put in a cannula from there so that any fluid coming out will promote attachment as opposed to pushing it away. So the, the cannula doesn't matter that much. I just kind of like my 27 gauge because it's a very narrow lumen and it has like a little bevel so it can kind of slide in pretty easily um, to the paracentesis. Okay. Next question from Dr. Richard Lehrer, topical versus block. So this is a good, this is a, um, I use 100% topical for all of my DMEX and DSEX. Uh, it wasn't always the case. So when I started doing DSEC in 2006 or whatever it was, it took me about two hours to do my first one. And, and I, of course, used general, thankfully. Um, so it kind of depends on where you are in your comfort level. Obviously, if you haven't started doing DMEC, you're not going to be super comfortable with, you know, the whole process. So, you know, I would probably opt for a block, if not general anesthesia, depending on the patient, depending on, uh, of course, other, you know, health concerns. Um, a block is what most people probably still do. But I, my DMEC procedure generally is about 15 minutes from start to finish. So I don't really use, have to block them. I'll use topical and, and not even um, intracameral because I don't want the people to dilate. Um, so I will just use topical and most patients are very comfortable and, and, and they do well. But again, I'm pretty confident that I can get it done within that time frame. If I'm teaching fellows, sometimes I will have them do a block. Sometimes again, and I'll have, I'll have them do general anesthesia if it's, if it's something where I don't feel that the patient can, can tolerate it. Next question from Dr. Jennifer Park. Do you rebubble with air or SF6? So in the clinic, I do have a container of SF6. Um, and, and, and one, I usually try to keep it, you know, stocked because I like the fact that SF6 provides a little bit longer uh, duration of the bubble on, on the order of one to three days for air versus maybe four to five days potentially with um, SF6. So I usually rebubble with SF6. You don't need to. Sometimes I've had a situation where um, I ran out, I didn't have it, I had to rebubble somebody, and you put air in. Not, a, not an issue at all. I just think it's the duration. So you might have to rebubble again with air if, if it doesn't attach, um, and it just won't stay as long. But, but again, the, the, the nice thing about air is that the percent potential for pupil block, pupillary block is a lot lower than, than SF6. I've tried to keep my SF6 concentration to 20% or less, around 18%, so that it's not expansile. I don't want it to expand and, and create a pupillary block. But again, I always do inferior peripheral um, iridotomies or iridectomies on all, all the cases. So I, I, I don't usually have too many cases of pupil block due to incorrect uh, SF6 concentration, but something to be aware of. Okay, next question from Dr. Katherine Crockett. Can you discuss wound construction? Looks like you have a long entry wound so that once you inject, the graft is under the entrance area. So I typically do a tunnel that is 2.4 millimeter keratome. So that's 2.4 millimeter in width. And the length of my tunnel is generally just like what I would do for cataract between probably 1.5 to two millimeters at the most, that'd be on the long end of things. Um, so it's not a very, very long tunnel. Um, it's, it's just long enough that it gives me a good seal. Um, and when you insert the graft, if I understand your cor question correctly, um, once I inject, the graft is under the entrance area. I'm not really quite sure what that means, but if you're saying that it kind of abuts up against the incision, well, that's possible. It depends on the diameter of the graft, of course. My graft preference that I have Eversight create for me is 8.0. If you look at the history of all, you know, the graft sizes in, in Rotterdam, Herrett Mellis and his group, they want 9.5 millimeter grafts. And that looks amazing. And you have lots of endothelial reserve peripherally. If you see a patient, and I did, I saw a patient, one of his first ones that he ever did, six years after DMEC, it looked like he had never had surgery done before because the entire endothelium was completely 
there were no seams basically, right? And so that's what I started doing initially. I started doing 9.5 millimeter grafts. The problem I found was that if I have to rebubble those grafts, the graft will be in the track of the paracentesis, so the edge of it. And so if I'm sticking a needle into it or a cannula into it, sometimes the graft could become dislodged or prevent my entry. So I started going smaller and smaller. I found that an 8.5 was okay, but an 8.0 is perfect because it doesn't interfere with my paracentesis tracks. An 8.0 millimeter graft is not going to overlap against your corneal incision, if you will, the main incision. But even if it does, it's not, it's not a big deal. I don't, think it, I don't think there's any detriment to having it abut against the main incision. I, I hope I under, understood your question correctly. Okay, next question from Dr. Philip Shands. What are your preferences for gas tamponade? So I'm, I'm assuming you mean at the time of the original procedure. Um, and so what I typically like to do is to inject the uh, SF6 gas. And so the um, air bubble completely fills the anterior chamber and the pressure of the eye is a little higher. I wanna say on the order of probably 40 to 50 millimeters of mercury, and it's just by tactile, I don't measure it. Um, one thing you can kind of do as you're injecting the air is to keep asking the patient if they can see the light. And so that's another reason why I don't like to do a block or anything, because I want them to be able to cooperate with this. But if they can see the light, you know the pressure is not gonna be 60 or 70 or 80. And so I like to keep it at that 40 to 50 range where I can feel that the, the palpable you know, um, tension in the eye is a little firm. So it's like a full air bubble and firm, and I like to leave that for about five minutes, and then I will reduce the pressure. I'll keep the, I'll keep the volume of the bubble the same, but I'll reduce the pressure so that the eye is just a little bit softer, and then I'll have them go and lay flat in the recovery area for about an hour, uh, and then they can sit up for, to about 45 degrees. And generally, by the time I check them in the office a few hours later, their air bubble is about 80, 80 to 85%, uh, and I have them stay in sort of an upright 45 degree position so that the aqueous covers the inferior uh, iridectomy. Again, I hope that was the question that you asked about the gas tamponade, but I don't like to um, you know, leave the air bubble completely uh, full with a firm pressure for too long, about five minutes, and then just leave a, a moderately sized air bubble. What I really don't wanna have is a pupil block in the middle of the night. Uh, I'd rather rebubble because I've become very comfortable rebubbling. So I can rebubble somebody in the office the next day very easily as opposed to having them be uncomfortable at one or two in the morning and they call me and I go in. I've had to do that in the past. But by, by having a little lighter air bubble fill or SF6 fill, I can at least make sure that they don't have much discomfort. And I usually check them in the office a few hours later so I know that if the air bubble is pretty full, I can release it at the slit lamp and make sure that they're not gonna have any issues. The last thing I want them to be is uncomfortable that first night of surgery. Okay, next question is from Dr. Zahir. Is it really true that the orientation of graft being attached to the donor is different as compared to when it is inserted in the recipient's eye? If yes, why is it so? I'm assuming by orientation, you mean um, uh, rotational orientation. Obviously the endothelium side has to be down and the stromal side has to be up. That's the same as in the natural situation, but um, there's really no way to identify the correct orientation uh, meridionally as far as the 12 o'clock position of the graft is lined up with the 12 o'clock position of the cornea. And I'm not sure there's a really need to do that because this tissue being only about 20 to 30 microns isn't really contributing significantly to any type of posterior corneal curvature changes. And so to my knowledge, it doesn't matter the orientation in terms of rotational orientation um, compared to what, how the tissue is harvested. Again, I hope that's uh, a clear answer to your question. If not, please, please clarify. Okay, next question is, do you have experience doing DMEX surgery over CHED patients? What is the appropriate age to do so? I don't have any experience doing CHED patients, uh, congenital hereditary endothelial dystrophy patients. I um, don't really do uh, pediatrics as part of my practice. Uh, and most of the patients that we're gonna be in that category are gonna be uh, pediatric patients uh, in order to prevent amblyopia and so on and so forth. I have uh, a few colleagues in Chicago who are, who are, are very uh, good at pediatric uh, transplantation and keratoplasty, and so I send them to them to do so. I don't have any personal experience. I do know that this procedure has been done in patients who are two and three uh, years of age. 
there are some issues, of course, with you know ensuring graft adherence. Um, but uh, a, a, a very good friend of mine, who's an optometrist, his daughter had um, um, a corneal dystrophy at a young age, and and she was very young. I forgot how old she was, but she had a endothelial transplant done, and, and she did very well. So it can be done in pediatric patients. Okay. Next question is: Do you suture the main incision? Absolutely. So I do. I mean, a lot of a lot of people will do. Um, a small incision not suture it, but I like to suture it right away. So as soon as I in insert the graft, uh, the first thing I do is put a suture in. And, and I think it just helps to prevent the, even a small possibility of graft extrusion. With a 2.4 millimeter incision, the chances are smaller than if you were using a big Jones tube with a three or 3.5 millimeter incision. But I still like to suture them every time. And, and I leave the suture in for, you know, weeks or months, doesn't matter. It, typically these are not astigmatically, you know, um, uh, difficult incisions to create, and so we don't, we don't we create a lot of problems with that. Okay, next question is any special considerations if doing DMEC in conjunction with FACO? That's a great question. There are a lot, there are a few things. Um, uh, the, um, I, I have always found that doing them separate, if possible, gives you better results, and for, for whatever reason, it's not a big difference, but I just like to do them separate if I can. Now, sometimes you can't. Sometimes you have a patient with advanced Fuchs um, and you know they're going to need a, a graft and then I'll do them at the same time. Um, but there are a couple of uh, situations that we have to be aware of when you're doing this. When we're doing the fake emulsification part, I like to make a little bit smaller capsule rexus. And that's so that the IOL complex has a little bit more support. I don't want it to be trampolining up and down because you're doing a lot of maneuvers during the DMAC uh, to unfold the graft air bubble, this, that. So potentially, if you are moving that IOL complex too far down, up and down, it could come up, it could cause issues. So I like to make a smaller capsule rexus, get a little bit more stability of the chamber that way. The other thing I like to do is to remove all of the viscoelastic, obviously, after your lens removal. Uh, my first case that I did many years ago with a combined, I think I forgot to remove the viscoelastic from uh, the bag. And so I put the IOL in and I constricted the pupil and I said, I was so ready to do DMEC. I did the DMEC and you can imagine that this is one of the ones I got a call at, at three in the morning saying she's an excruciating pain in the emergency room. So um, don't do that. So make sure you evacuate all the viscoelastic. The other reason to ev evacuate viscoelastic, of course, is that it can cause um, problems with adherence of the graft and not to mention potential for endothelial, you know, damage or toxicity. So remove all the viscoelastic completely once I'm done with that portion, then I will use a myotic, like a myocol or myostat to constrict the pupil. And then I will do my iridectomy and then proceed as if it were a routine, you know, standalone DMEC. And if you've done that, if you've removed all the viscoelastic, you have a smaller capsule rexus, the chamber stability is, is pretty good and there's not as much um, issues. But, but there's still some, I, I like having um, a graft or excuse me, an IOL that's, that's firmly secured into place after a few weeks or a month and then do the DMEC if possible. But sometimes you can't do that. Dr. Majumdar, before we proceed, we do have quite a few more questions. Are you okay with continuing or would yeah. you like to address the questions offline? No, I'm, I'm fine. I can- Go I can Okay, great. Okay, next question is, how do you estimate the size amount of the bubble? So, um, I'm assuming that you're talking about when the graph is being uh, unfolded and you're ready to put the air bubble in. Um, estimating the amount of the bubble uh, that you put into the eye, if that's the question, the answer is we just put it in until you feel like you've got a complete air fill and the eye is somewhat firm. Um, sometimes as you're putting air in or SF6 in, it will escape out and so there's kind of a give and take. Sometimes you go through a lot more in a certain case than others. Um, if you're asking about how to estimate the size or the amount of the bubble post-op, so in the, in the clinic the next day, it's really ballpark. I'm not sure it really matters that much whether it's 80% or 85%. The number one thing is that it um, clears the inferior iridectomy so that the, uh, there's aqueous um, covering the iridectomy. That way you know that there's continual flow and you're going to not have your pupillary block. But as long as it's, um, you know, on, on a, the first day of the surgery post op day zero when I see them in the office, I'd like there to be about an 80 to 85% air fill. Uh, I don't want 100 and I don't want 50. I think 50 is probably too low, um, 100 is too much, somewhere 
around 80 to 85 percent, they're going to be good. Now, sometimes if the air bubble is too much, as I said, I'll release a little bit. If it's too little, I can always refill it. But sometimes if it's kind of on the side of being a little low, let's say 70 percent, 60 percent, you can change your post-op um, instructions and say, okay, you know what? I told you to go and sit up because I thought you had a full air bubble, but it's kind of gone down already. So now I'm going to have you lay flat. So now I'm going to have you lay flat at five or 10 degrees and not at 45 degrees so that the bubble spreads out and allows more contact between the uh, endothelium or the DMEC graft uh, and the air bubble. So that is um, um, what I typically will do if the bubble is too low. And that kind of segues into another area that I'm going to talk about. I think it's the next question is, is what's the protocol for supine positioning after DMEC? So I've always done an inferior iridectomy and a fairly full air bubble. And I thought that rather than having them stay in the, in the clinic or in the OR, when I went to see Mellis in 2013, they did all theirs under general. And the patient had the procedure done, took them about an hour, 45 minutes, an hour to do the procedure because they were super meticulous, as I said, about getting every single piece of Decimates out, 9.5 millimeter graph. And the patient sat there under general anesthesia for an extra hour after that. And so that's, I said, I don't want to do that. I said, my, my OR would kill me if I did that. And, and I don't think it's a great, great idea to do that. So, so I said, how can I get this patient out of the operating room as fast as possible? So I said, I want to do a full air bubble. And if I have an inferior ectomy, I will be able to do that as long as the, the bubble clears the PI. And I don't want to necessarily have them go lay flat. Mo most of our retina patients who have um, uh, detachments, they hate the face down position. At least it's not face down, but they still hate lying flat on their back. So what I said was, you guys go ahead and you sit up on two, three pillows, 45 degrees. You can watch TV. You can be on your iPad, whatever you want to do at some point, but you're sitting upright, which is more comfortable. And you can do that because the air bubble's full and you have an inferior iridectomy in place. So my recommendations for the patients for the first uh, hour, I do keep them in recovery flat, and then I let them go home to my office. I'll check them a few hours later and then they're at 45 degrees until the next day. They come in the next day, and if they're doing well, they continue 45 degrees. If the bubble has gone down a lot and I don't want to rebubble them, I'll tell them to go flat. Or if it's too much, I'll release it or whatever the case is. Typically by about, I do procedures on Tuesdays. So I see them on Wednesday, I'll see them on Friday. By Friday, if they're doing pretty well over the weekend, they can kind of resume some normal activity, but I still want them to be mostly sedentary. So I'll tell them that in a given hour, 60 minutes, I want you to be, um, you know, at least uh, in the first two days, I want you to be 50, 55 minutes, I want you to be sitting down, five, 10 minutes, you can get up to go to the bathroom. Then as we get to that first weekend, I'm telling them that they can start to do maybe 50-50. So half the time, you know, sitting, half the time doing some light things, but certainly no vigorous activity. And this all is predicated on the fact that by day three or day five, or whatever it is, day seven for sure, if the graph is attached real well, the bubble's going away, their vision is improving, then I let them increase their activities, you know, exponentially after that. Okay. Next question, do your patients feel much discomfort when you do the iridectomy if you're only using topical anesthesia for your DMEX? Yeah, maybe a little. I can't, I can't speak from being on that side of the table, but um, most patients don't feel significant discomfort. Uh, I do it with um, a vitrector. So it's really like, you know, one, not even one second, I'd say half a second of, of discomfort. They might feel a little pinch, but it's not, not um, unbearable, as you would think. Okay, next question. Is DMEC with TRAB or TUBE any extra problems? Yeah, obviously there can be, you know, you know, because there's a constant source of stuff going inside the ad, outside the ad. So air bubble do, does not stay in. Um, I typically like to do patients who have uh, tubes or trabs or unicameral patients, whether a phacic or they've got big, you know, issues with the zonules or whatever the case may be, I'd like to do these sutured IOLs. I like to do DSEC for these patients instead of DMEC. Uh, the last thing I want is for that graft to go back posteriorly. Um, and so that is one reason why I do it. As far as the tubes and trabs, the, the issue is that you just have a very, very hard time, just like with DSEC, to keep that air in there and keep the eye pressurized as much as you can. Now, the good news is they have a trab or tube, so they're not going to get the pupillary block. You can pretty much pump up the air 100% and let them go home, and they probably will do okay. But my feeling is that why, um, why am I doing DMEC? I'm doing DMEC 
because of the fact that I think that they get a small but tangible visual improvement. Most of our DSEC patients do fine. They do like 20, 25, 20, 30, no problem. But if they can get 20, 20, that's where I like to do DMEC. Now, if someone has advanced glaucoma, they need a tube or trab, but they've got some other issues going on, I'm not really worried if they can get one extra line of visual acuity. And so what I'd like to do at that point is do a procedure that I think is going to give them the biggest uh, bang for their buck and, and not have to go back to the operating room for any other reason. So I'll put a, a, a DSEC in those patients. I'll, I'll do a suture pass through and I'll tie it to the cornea so that I know that the graft is not going anywhere. And these patients do very well. So I'm not bashing DSEC at all. I think it has a place in these kinds of patients. I typically have not done DMEC, I can't, maybe a couple, but not too many with tubes or trabs or unicameral patients. And I have not done any DMECs under a graft. Uh, so DSEC under a graft works very well. Some people have said that DMEC under a graft works as well. I just haven't done it. I feel like um, in order for there to be good adherence of a DMEC graft, uh, you have to have um, very little decimase attachment. So when we do a DSEC, we'll strip decimase smaller than the actual graft because the stroma can stick real well of the DSEC to the end patient's endothelium and the, and the decimase. But in a DMEC, what we do is we usually have a bigger area of uh, decimatorexis, and then we'll have a smaller graft because we need that decimase to be in contact with stroma and not decimase. And, and when that, and that happens, sometimes there's a higher incidence of, of graft dehiscence. With a graft, a lot of times with my deemed sex under graft, I won't even strip. I'll just put the DSEC underneath uh, and it works very well. It attaches well. I'm not convinced yet that the DMEC will do the same. And I don't want to go about stripping decimase on a graft. Sometimes I think that might weaken the graft host junction. But people do it. People have done DMEC, maybe a smaller DMEC within the graft, um, within the, the old uh, PKP graft. And that might work well. I just haven't done any. Okay, next question is if the patient has both corneal edema and cataract, is it better to do combined FACO DMEC versus staging FACO then DMEC? Yeah, I, you know, I, 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 I did, you're right, I did answer that and I'll answer it again, I don't mind. I just feel like I, I like to do them separately if possible. Now, if someone has real frank corneal edema, they're not going to survive with just a cataract operation. They're not going to see well um, enough to skip the DMEC. And that's the reason you'd want to do them separately is if there's a chance that you could skip the DMEC. I saw a patient today um, who had corneal thickness 5, 80, 5, 90, uh, good, you know, moderate gute all across, um, and her vision was like 20, 40, 20, 50 with a cataract. And so I said, you know, you do have this, and she kind of was shying away. She didn't really want to do the transplant, especially with this whole COVID situation, which we can talk about differently, but, but she didn't want to do it. So I said, why don't we just do the, the cataract in a couple of weeks? And we'll see how you do. If you end up doing great and she's not bothered by, because, you know, she's not bothered with the cornea, the cornea doesn't get more edematous, I'd be happy to just do cataract alone and get, get her, you know, a pass on the DMEC if, if she can. But if somebody comes in with frank edema, you probably have to do them both together. I think it's just, you know, makes sense. Now, the only caveat there is if you can't visualize the FACO part of it. So if you come, somebody comes in with a real edematous cornea, then sometimes you might have to do DMEC alone first and then do FACO. I've done that certainly in patients who are younger, phagic patients who have bad FUPS dystrophy. I've done the DMEC first, and then some have had cataract, you know, six months, a year, two years, whenever they need it. And, and really, there is a slight potential for the graft to be affected, but most patients do very well. Okay, next question is how to manage if when you inject the dork tube and it splits out of the entry wound, making DMEC graft out of tube? Okay, so this has happened, of course, to me, and, and it will happen to you probably too, but the chance of it happening with the dork tube is much less because, again, you saw on the video how long that tube is. It's not short, so it can go all the way into the eye, and I like to put the tube into the eye over the pupil. If you watch, I can put it all the way into the eye and then, you know, um, insert the graft. Um, if you do that, the chance of the tube itself coming out of the entry wound on its own is very unlikely. I've had cases with the dork tube where I put the graft in and I remove the tube, no problem, but in that process, maybe the patient has Valsalva or maybe the, maybe the wound construction is not perfect, the graft can come out. But you have to be very careful when you're putting the, the graft in. If you put the tube in all the way and you make sure that as you come out, 
maybe you're putting a little pressure on the wound if the graft wants to migrate towards you you can eliminate that problem 99% of the time if it does come out you have not lost anything maybe you've lost a couple of cells but i would then as long as it's not on the ground if it's still on the patient's you know within the within the sterile field of course i i have then reloaded the DMEC graft and they do, I rinse it in BSS and then reinsert it and that's that's fine. Okay. okay, and this will be our last question. What is your choice of DMEC graft size? Right, so you know in the past when I said when I first trained it was a 9.5 because that's what they were using and it looked beautiful because it was the entire cornea was covered. I just found it very difficult to put another instrument into the eye after the fact at the slit lamp where I need to rebubble somebody, I was bumping into the graph. So I made the graph a little smaller, 8.5. Then I went to 8.0, and that's where I am now, 8.0. I think that works well. I think it's a good combination of having enough endothelial cell reserve, whereas you don't have, like with a maybe a three or four millimeter graph, I don't think there's enough endothelial cells, but with an eight millimeter graph, you have plenty of endothelial reserve. At the same time, you also have a gap between the limbus and the graft so that you can enter into the incision, into, into the paracentesis after the procedure if you need to do a, a, a rebubbling at, at the office. Okay, and that is the last question. We have no further questions uh, in the queue. So on behalf of Eversight, I would like to thank everyone again for joining us today. The webinar has been recorded and will be available on our website to view on demand. As a reminder, we are hosting this series every Wednesday evening throughout the month of May. If you haven't registered for our other programs, please consider doing so. As we all continue to work through this time of uncertainty, we find that coming together virtually is a way to bring some positivity to our day and stay focused on the goal of returning to some form of normalcy in the near future. You will be receiving a follow-up email shortly after the webinar concludes. It would be greatly appreciated if you would provide us with your feedback on today's session. A very special thank you to Dr. Majmadar for serving as today's speaker and for providing us with your invaluable expertise on this subject. I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night, Dr. Majmadar. <laughs>